Uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Carrie Karikas from Florida Gulf Coast University. Dan. Dan. I know. Oh, Walter. Email is here. <laughs> uh, not on his listserv for um, Friday Book Club, which will meet next Friday. We're reading Economic Controversies by Murray Rothbard. Um, you need to be on that listserv to get the chapters and the announcements and so on and so forth. So send Walter an email. We'll add you to that listserv. Your inbox will be flooded with opportunities for the rest of your life. <laughs> uh, without further ado, Dr. Kerry Karikas from Florida Gulf Coast University is going to be talking about discovering law, Hayekian competition, and Iceland. Thank you, Kerry. Right, you did not warn me ahead of time that I was going to be filmed, so that adds another degree of nervousness. I don't like that, so I won't look that way. I'm not avoiding that side. All right, um, the title of this talk, Discovering Law, Hacking Competition in Medieval Iceland, it's actually stemming from a paper uh, that I have co-authored with Dr. Claudia Williamson, so that's where I'm pulling this discussion from. I believe that you've had her speak at your economics club before, um, so you're probably already familiar with her, so this is part of some of our research together. And this is the first piece, and we're hoping to continue and do a couple more papers in this vein, um, exploring some of the private mechanisms of law, law enforcement, and Medieval Iceland. Okay, so let's begin with a quote here. I know that you've probably spoken, uh, if not in your classrooms, and in some of the other presentations that you've had during your economics club about institutions, the importance of institutions, how they matter for economic growth, and some of the functions that they serve. So, how they're going to be providing. Uh, framework in which individuals can interact with one another, reducing uncertainty, uh, facilitating exchange, and promoting cooperation among individuals, being some of the important aspects of institutions. Uh, in this paper, I'm looking specifically at institutions of uh, private rule of law, so legal systems that had emerged in medieval Iceland that were able to facilitate again cooperation and exchange between individuals in that society. Contrary to popular belief, it wasn't as violent as what some people may think. So I know that there's this impression um, that you've had a lot of feuding and things of that nature happening in Iceland, but it wasn't as violent as what some people would believe it to be. Part of the reason for that is because of the institutions that had emerged in medieval Iceland. All right, so what I'm going to start out with in this presentation, a little bit of the basis um, in terms of what we're referring to as the Hayekian theory of competition. Again, some of this will probably be reviewed for some of you. If you have questions as I go through it, that's fine. But then I'd like to get to the particulars of medieval Iceland, which I think is the more interesting part of this presentation. All right, so in terms of institutional design, how do we design things like property rights or a rule of law, things of that nature? So you have two different alternatives, broadly speaking. You can think of it as a centralized, top-down approach. So you have things like formal government, um, where you have law being created or private property institutions being created so you can have things posed from above or you have the decentralized bottom-up approach so a spontaneous order so as Hyde would say when you have rules and institutions emerging through human action and not through human design um, so in medieval Iceland you had this decentralized bottom-up um, occurrence of institutions so you have these spontaneous orders and rules were emerging in that fashion all right, in terms of the Hayekian theory of competition, it describes a process whereby information available to no single person or groups of persons is essentially discovered. Um, so if you are familiar with F.A. Hayek's use of knowledge in society, he talks about the knowledge problem and part of problems when you're thinking about institutions, if you're trying to design them from the bottom or from the top down to so that centralized approach where you have government trying to create institutions. No single individual is going to have all of the information necessary to do so, right? Be able to account for everyone's preferences and kind of be familiar with all aspects of design institutions as well. So here we have, instead of that approach of spontaneous order, uh, what we're going to have in this case law being discovered. Right? So where you probably thought about this idea before is if you're thinking about 
uh, decentralized markets where you're going to have a discovery process driven by market prices. So market prices will be giving individuals information about relative scarcities of different goods and services. Prices would be providing incentives that are guiding entrepreneurs to the system of profits and losses. And then in short, prices would be communicating this dispersed knowledge so that people could be making decisions um, without having central planning and having things emerge spontaneously. This is going to hinge on a system of private property. So in Ludwig von Mises' paper, Economic Calculation from the Socialist Commonwealth, he discusses how it is that you have to have private property um, leading to a mechanism of prices before you can have prices emerge. You first have to have trade, which means that you need to own things. So we're going to be basing this on a system of private property, which is then going to help to communicate information for these institutions to emerge. So here we're going to be applying this idea to legal institutions and law. So again, we can have a discovery process whereby law is not created by individuals, but where it's going to be um, sought out and going to emerge. If you think about common law versus civil law, common law is going to be more adaptable, where you have judges that are deciding on cases through this process, you're going to have rules emerge. Those rules will be uh, reflecting the preferences and norms and uh, culture of individuals in that area. And it's going to be more flexible and more dynamic versus if you had a civil law system where you're trying to design things from the top down, it's going to be more rigid. You might end up with things that people don't actually value, so laws that nobody maybe wanted that are being imposed from the top where you may not have the necessary information to be accounting for uh, cultural norms and things that people do value. Alright, with medieval Iceland, the age of settlements occurred between 870 and 930, so the period that I'm going to be talking about uh, is about 930 to 1262, so we have what's called the free state, so during this period of time you did not have a centralized government in medieval Iceland, so they were able to exist well <coughs> over that time period without having a centralized state, and you did have court, so you did have people going out and um, you know, a lot of violence, as I said at the beginning, but you had incentives in place for cooperation, you had mechanisms for dispute resolution, and all of these were occurring during this time period without the centralized state. Uh, people were coming to Iceland primarily from Norway and Scandinavia, so you had people coming with similar backgrounds, they were bringing their culture with them, so they had similar ideas in terms of things that they found important when they were discovering their institutions and these legal systems were emerging. Uh, particularly, they put a lot of weight and a lot of value on political and legal rights of free farmers, so that was something that was very important to them at the time. So the Icelandic Commonwealth, or Free State, um, was the period between 930 and 1262. Another important date, um, in 1117, started to write their laws down. So Grogus refers to the laws of medieval Iceland, so initially these were going to be passed down um, orally, and then eventually they started to write these down. So you have Grogus in 1117, which I believe stands for Grogus Laws, um, and we're translating that. All right, the economy in medieval Iceland primarily centered on animal husbandry, and it was more hunter-gathering, so they were kind of limited in some of the things that they could grow. So it was hunter-gathering, animal husbandry, society. Along with that means that individuals needed a lot of land. So land was very important during this time period. Uh, you would have disputes over land arise, but they did have mechanisms in place where they were able to peacefully uh, come to resolutions in terms of these disputes whenever you had issues with private property rights um, and trespass and things of that nature. All right, some of the institutional arrangements that were important in medieval Iceland, we'll talk about a few of the most important ones. It started with the household. Again, land was important. Um, initially, people, when they moved to medieval Iceland, were paying large tracts of land that were later broken up, so land was a scarce commodity um, during this time period. So individuals belonged to a household and also belonged to something <coughs> called a prepper. Uh, this is very interesting. It was a local administrative unit. Um, these were arranged geographically. And a prepper was composed of 20 households. So 20 households were combined to form a prepper. 
each household had to belong to one of these geographic organizations. So you had to belong to a prepper. Um, with this, in order to change, it's very rigid in terms of your ability to change into a different prepper. If you're going to do so, you'd have to have a recommendation of the previous one. Uh, so there was some different <coughs> nature to how these preppers were formed. These met three times a year regularly, and they would have additional meetings as needed. There were two primary concerns with the prepper. They were taking care of things like orphans, and it acted as an insurance system. So if you had orphans in the area, they would take turns passing them from one household to another, uh, depending on people's relative wealth, and they would make sure that these individuals were cared for. And then again, they acted as an insurance system. So you would be paying uh, some contribution to the wrapper, and then in cases of fire, or if you had diseases with livestock, and they would be covering part of your losses. So it was an insurance type of system. Another function that they served was to control summer grazing lands so that you did not have overgrazing. And these continued to operate even after the end of the Free State. So the Free State uh, ended about 1262 to 1264. And after that time, you still had the prepper operating to take care of these insurance issues and things like orphans. Uh, in fact, in 1703, there were reportedly still 162 of these units. So they functioned for a long time. In Iceland. We have the chieftain thing relationships. Two primary actors in medieval Iceland talk about farmers, and then you have chieftains. So everybody had to belong to a chieftain or have, say, uh, you would become in thing with a chieftain when you form this relationship. This was not geographic, so because uh, contrast to the river, it wasn't a geographic relationship. You had to be in thing, as they would call it with the chieftain, but you could choose a chieftain that you wanted and your chieftains also were able to deny you. So if you were asking to be a thing with a particular chieftain and they didn't want to have this relationship with you, then they could say no, so they could decline that. Um, this was a formal relationship, and what the chieftains would be doing is they would be your representative if you had disputes. So they would be taking your courses through the legal system. They would be your arbitrator. Uh, they would also be helping you enforce any claims that you would have. So if there was some court ruling, they would be the ones that were helping you to enforce these claims. Also act as uh, somebody to try and resolve disputes without getting to court when possible. So there wouldn't be important certain dysfunction whenever you would have these disputes arise. You were free to change your allegiance, so if farmers wanted to change chieftains, you could do so. So if you felt that one wasn't representing you well, or you weren't getting quality services from your chieftain, um, then you were free to change your alliance. Likewise, chieftains were free to end the relationship themselves, so they could terminate the relationship if they no longer wanted to be anything with a farmer. Interesting thing about the chieftaincies is that they were private commodities. So these were going to be uh, private property. It was something that could be sold, bought, traded. It could be inherited. So it wasn't just something that was passing down throughout a family from one person to the next. It could be inherited through family lineage, but it could also be sold and bought and whatnot. Uh, this meant that if you had people that were very ambitious and you were wanting to hold a chieftaincy, that you could work towards that, which usually included being able to have knowledge of law, be good at resolving disputes uh, and things of that nature. So you would be showing that you had different tacit knowledge and skills needed to be able to hold a chieftaincy. So if you were able to develop that, um, then you could be successful in getting a chieftaincy. The chieftaincies themselves might be owned by more than one individual. So you'd have one what we call chieftaincy, which you'd have different people owning that. Uh, if you had a chieftaincy that different people owned then it would mean that when it came time for dispute resolution, when you were taking things to court, then you would decide who would be acting in those different procedures. And a little bit later, we'll talk about their law council. You would only have one individual that would be participating in this law council as well, if it was owned by more than one individual. Another interesting thing about this is that females could also own a chieftaincy. They couldn't act in all of the functions, so they might have to designate a male to do some of um, prosecution and things like that, that they could own um, chieftains. <coughs> and lastly, we have the assemblies 
in the things. So these chieftaincies themselves and the way that their assemblies and things were formed, uh, very important for how they had this discovery of law, how the legal system emerged in medieval Iceland. The assemblies, uh, or things, we use both terms, were going to be the component of your legal system people would meet to be resolving disputes. So you would have local things, which would be on a smaller scale, and then you had kind of a multi-tiered system uh, for their courts, where you would have larger uh, court systems for the different quarters of medieval Iceland, and then they had what's called the all thing, which would be kind of like your final court, where you would be trying cases that hadn't been decided at some of the lower courts. Um, these probably started more informally, so they likely were just informal in nature, and then they started to evolve to meet more regularly, and became then eventually to where you would have certain times and designated times of the year where these things would be meeting. The chieftains and the, what was the, the insurance groups? The that was with the record. Okay. Were they related at all? Or because like one was geographic but the other one wasn't? They weren't. Um, and those are interesting. Uh, with the record, I think it would almost be another paper in and of itself yeah. to look at it more. Because each time I give this talk, there's a lot of questions about the record. Like was it itself some type of government kind of institution? Um, which I would say no because you don't have some central person over it. But yet it was geographic and you had to belong to one and make contributions. So it's an interesting entity. Um, as I said, it was more for insurance and things like that, but it wasn't tied with your chieftain. So if you were a part of a rapper and your chieftain could be located elsewhere. Um, the key with the chieftain is that they had to belong to your quarter. So Iceland was eventually divided into four quarters, your north, south, east, and west. So the chieftain had to come from your quarter. So it couldn't be anywhere in Iceland, but within that quarter you weren't limited to somebody who was so geographic in nature. Whereas with the rapper, you were. Things like that would be important, though, in terms of enforcing any judgments that were made or when it comes time to uh, go to court, because a lot of these things rested on the support that you had and the different ties that you had with individuals and who had more people on their side. So it could matter in that sense mm -hmm. if you were having people that are maybe more knowledgeable of the law or more able to support you if you do have support. So a couple important kind of milestones in the evolution of the Icelandic court system. In about 930, we have the creation of the All Thing. Again, the people that were moving to medieval Iceland were bringing with them their cultural norms and some of the ideas and institutions that they were already familiar with. Um, these local things being one of them. So by about 930, you already had the creation of the All Thing. This would be the big, uh, big assembly, most important assembly that would meet every year. So it would be meeting two weeks in June at a place called the Thing Plain. So this would be where your different court sessions would be held. So you'd have your quarter courts, which I will discuss more in a moment. And you would also have your fifth court, which again was that kind of highest court, or you can think of it as your court of appeals in a way. So both of these would happen to be all things. This wasn't just a legal function, so serving to hold these assemblies, you would also have laws being recited and uh, some amendments and changes to laws being made. It was also a social aspect to the all thing. Right? At the time, you didn't have towns um, in medieval Iceland, so people were relatively spread out. Again, they needed to have a lot of land for how the economy was based. Uh, but this served as a function to get people together. So it was a big deal when it was time for the all things. So people would be holding uh, different markets, and they would be trading with one another and be able to socialize. Uh, so this was a big event, not only because of the legal aspect of it, but just the socialization in general with individuals. All right, when the all thing was created in 930, at that time there were about 36 chieftaincies. So again, some of these chieftaincies could be held by more than one person. But you had 36 chieftaincies at this time. There were different local things. So you had a spring thing, which was called the var thing. And for this one, you would have three chieftains getting together. So it would be three chieftaincies, and then all of their followers were required to go to the spring thing. 
with the spring thing, you would have a court of prosecution and you would have your courts of payment. So it was serving two different purposes. These things would meet in May. Uh, again, you had to have all of the followers of the chieftains coming to this spring. <coughs> Another important local thing is called the V. This thing convened in August, so it was following the time period of the all thing. The primary focus of this was just information. Right? So here you would have people reporting on what had happened at the all thing, so people weren't required to go to the lead, but it was serving a very important information process. So you would pretty much be saying what happened during that year's dispute season, right? That's one way to think about it. So you would say who had won different cases, what disputes had arisen, it would also be giving you information about what different individuals did in terms of support. Um, so when it really came down to it, who was there to be supporting uh, in terms of the chieftains representing their followers well and vice versa. Um, one quote taken out of the book regarding these things says, the lead had an additional function within the context of the political economy. Publicly defined who a chieftain's thing was at the conclusion of that summer's dispute season, Group noted thing and who had defected during the season when push had come to shove and counted the current membership. So this was really more about information sharing. Okay? Um, so you could then see who members were at the end of that dispute season and be talking about reputations. So you could be saying you know, who's a good chieftain and uh, also which followers might be problem makers as well. Initially, there, as we had mentioned, there are probably about 12 bar things spread relatively evenly throughout medieval Iceland. So if you had 12 of these spring things, each one which would be comprised of three different chieftaincies, that's where you're getting the 36 um, initial or what they call ancient chieftaincies. Eventually, you have Iceland divided into quarters. So you had these 12 ancient chieftaincies, and then they included a new springtime thing in the northern quarter. So it was the more populous quarter. So you have an additional bar thing, which means that you have an additional three chieftaincies that are now in the northern quarter. These new uh, chieftaincies, they were going to be limited in the functions that they could serve. So they weren't going to be able to nominate uh, some of the judges when you would get to the quarter courts and the fifth court later on. So they were a little bit more limited in their capacity. All right. Eventually, three new chieftaincies were then created in each of the other quarters, just to have a balance of power in them. So you had these 36 ancient chieftaincies, you now have the new chieftaincies, and eventually you had a total of 48. And I do have a pretty picture to show you in a moment, because this gets confusing of all of the different chieftaincies and how this interacts. So I'll have a visual for you. Um, so with these 48 chieftaincies, again, the new ones, you want to be able to nominate judges to the quarter courts if they were able to participate in the law council, which was called the libretto. So they would be able to sit in on that law council where you had a discussion of law where you had changes to law being made. Right. With the libretto, it was the, we would call, I not to use the term, but you could think of it kind of as a, a legislative unit in a way, where you would have law being discussed, um, and you would have the different laws that were already in place being recited. There was really only one formal individual in medieval Iceland. Um, it was called the law speaker. So this person would be elected, um, would be voted on by the different chieftains. So they would vote on a law speaker. They would serve a term of three years. And the function of the law speaker was really just to be knowledgeable about the law itself. So they had to recite a third of the laws every law season. So when you had the all thing, and everybody met at the thing playing, then part of it was having the secret to meet have the law speaker recite all of the different laws and he would do a third of these each year. He was able to bring advisors with him so that way if he had any questions or needed to have some clarification of laws, he would be able to do so. In terms of the libretta, uh, you would have all of the chieftaincies participating, so all of the 48, the ancient and the new chieftaincies, would be present. Chieftains were able to bring with them two advisors. So you would have the law speakers in the middle, and then you would have three concentric circles surrounding the law speaker, with the chieftains themselves kind of in the middle, and they'd have an advisor in front and behind. Um, so some of the thing men that they were bringing with them um, as they were trying to vote on different issues and whatnot, as he had some sort of dispute with the different rules. 
So you did have then this additional legal function other than the courts happening at the all thing. At the establishment of the quarter courts, here you would decide cases that could not be decided at those local bar things. So again, the bar things were meeting in May, and the all thing was meeting in June. And during this meeting, you would have the quarter courts that would be in session. So a quarter court would either be cases that could not be decided at the bar thing, or if you had a case that hadn't yet gone to court, but it involved people from different quarters, so somebody from the western and the southern, or whichever, so you would be able to have people from different quarters hearing a case for the first time at these quarter courts. At the quarter courts and at the local courts, you would have uh, judges selected. So you have 36 judges, um, both at your bar thing and at these quarter courts. So your chieftains would be appointing 12 farmers to act as judges in each of these cases. What was interesting for the quarter courts is that each chieftain would be selecting 12 farmers to act as judges, and then all of those farmers would get together, and what they would do is draw lots to decide what quarter court you would be on. So you may be serving on a quarter that's not where you reside, so that helped with having some relative impartiality when it came to court decisions and the cases as they were being tried. So you didn't know what quarter court you were going to sit on. And the only people that could elect judges to these quarter courts were those 36 original chieftaincies. So those new chieftaincies were not able to do so. Lastly, we have the introduction of the fifth court in 1005. So if you had cases that could not be decided at the quarter courts, then they would be decided at the fifth court. So you can also think of it kind of as a court of appeal. Um, here you had to have, at the quarter court, you had to have agreement of 31 out of the 36 judges, whereas when it reached the fifth court, you just had to have a simple majority in order to decide each of the cases. In the fifth court, now all of your judges were able to nominate farmers, or all of your chieftains were able to nominate farmers to serve as judges. So all 48 chieftaincies would make their nominations. But the fifth court, your litigants were able to get rid of 12. So then that brought the number back down to 36. So at all of these courts, you would have a total of 36 judges that would be deciding on the case. Clears it all up, right? <laughs> Red and black standing on the best call. All right, with this court structure, have the fifth court in the center. Again, it's acting as your court of appeals, surrounded by each of the quarter courts. For the different quarter courts, I have a box coming off of each of them that has a V. So that's going to be symbolizing the bar thing, which again we said was the springtime thing. And then you have little dots coming off of the V, which is representing the individual chieftaincies. So the solid dots would be the ancient chieftaincies. So they have all of the um, responsibilities, nominated judges, so full responsibilities when it comes to the all thing. Then you have the open V with the open circles that's representing those new chieftaincies. Once you have that new additional bar thing added in the uh, northern quarter. So the northern quarter, they had an additional bar thing, whereas in all of the other quarters, they didn't have an additional thing. They had just added three additional chieftains, so that way the number of individuals that were serving under the Bretzel would be the same, so they still have that balance of power. Part of the reason that this works so well, and I'll come back, that your chieftaincies were a private property. So this is one of the ways in which you had discovery happening um, in the emergence of these legal systems. So the chieftains were private property that could be bought, sold, gifted, or shared. So people that were most knowledgeable about the law, and those that had the greatest incentives um, towards having a chieftaincy would be the ones that would be a chieftain. Right? So it kind of went to people who valued it most, just like goods and services in a market system are going to go to those individuals that value them most. You had competition between the chieftaincies. If you were a chieftain that didn't have any followers, then you weren't going to be a very powerful chieftain. Right? So one of the keys was not only getting the office of chieftaincy, but getting and maintaining different followers and farmers. In order to have followers, you were going to have to be offering your services at a price that's acceptable, 
Um, so we'd be taking gifts and things of that nature in order to be helping you more when it came time for dispute resolution and advocacy and things like that. So you had to be giving a quality product to your followers. And you also had to be knowledgeable about the law and about the workings of this entire legal system. Uh, a lot of the success of chieftaincies would be re resting on reputation, <coughs> resting on your different ties. So some were going to be more powerful because they're going to have better relationships with other individuals. Um, when it came time for the all thing, you would show up with your followers. And again, some cases might be settled before you got to court because it would be how well is your chieftain able to negotiate with the other side and you would try to negotiate some of these things before actually taking it to court. So chieftains that were better able to do that resolve things peacefully without having to go through the whole system. <coughs> then it would be more successful. So the competition between chieftaincies then was leading to the discovery process and it was also going to be uh, helping so that the individual farmers were going to have better representation. Um, wouldn't it be likely to be abused by powerful chieftains? If you had a chieftain that wasn't treated well, then you would be able to go to a different chieftain. All right, this would be similar when you're thinking about common law. So here your chieftains would kind of be like judges in the common law system, right, where they're trying to discover law, but they're not going to be creating it. So you would have to be taking into account individuals' preferences and values and things of that nature um, through this dispute process. So it's going to be more like a common law versus a civil law where everything would be created and imposed from the top down. The multi-tiered system was also going to incentivize impartial rulings. You had relative impartiality of judgments. And when it came to the court of courts, you would have different chieftains that would be electing farmers to be judges, but they didn't know what court they were going to serve on. So you had some relative impartiality with the judgments there. Um, and then also, as you would have people serving on courts, the different sections of medieval Iceland event, which had some standardization of law, so you had these private rules that were emerging um, that were relatively standard across the entire island. You also had private law enforcement. So you didn't have jails, and you didn't have some centralized state, so you just had restitution for any of the judgments. So if you were trespassing on someone's property, or if you have uh, been found guilty of murdering somebody or being aggressive and violent, whatever it might be, you just have restitution towards individuals. <coughs> the actual judgment was also a private commodity that could be bought or sold. So if you didn't have enough power to, say, enforce your claim, right, then you could sell your judgment to somebody else that does have a better ability to go and try and receive that uh, payment from whoever the aggressor is. So these judgments were also going to be private property and tradable commodities. Uh, there was also outlawry in medieval Iceland. So you either had payments that had to be made if you were trespassing against someone or damaging property or whatnot. And then they would have two forms of outlawry. It could be a lesser outlaw or a full outlaw. Right? So say that you had murdered somebody, you're going to be claimed to be a full outlaw. Full outlaw has to leave the island with no aid. If you're found to be helping that person and yourself are also an outlaw, I mean, you have to leave and never come back. Lesser outlaw would be gone for three years and then come back to Iceland after that time period. What's interesting with their way of the system of the outlawry, if you had an individual that killed three outlaws, because outlaws could be killed if they did not leave the island, that you were able to kill them um, on site. So if you killed, if you yourself were an outlaw, you killed three other outlaws, then you were brought back into the law. So, they <laughs> the so if you killed three other outlaws, you were accepted back into the law. So it was an interesting system. <laughs> um, what was also neat with it, a lot of this rested on your ability to enforce these claims, kind of not only the knowledge of law and being able to move through this process, but also the support that you had when you were trying to get payments from individuals, uh, the judgments that you made against them. So you have a lot of intricate ties being formed. So you have the chieftain thing relationship being one tie between individuals. But you would also have things like fosterage, where maybe you would have your child live with somebody else, they would raise your child to create some fictitious kinship bond. 
So that way, when it comes to time, if, say, somebody trespassed against you, you have additional support system. So they would create all of these different fictitious kinship ties, and they would have different um, methods of doing so. Again, you have know, foster between one, you might have gift giving, and things of that nature. To have these bonds that way you have support if you were ever to find yourself in a situation where you would need individuals to come to back for you. So it's very interesting. <coughs> what was neat about medieval Iceland law was so important to their society. So it really permeated um, medieval Iceland. So this was talking about cultural focus. So you have a tendency of cultures to exhibit more complexity and wider scope in some aspects in institutions than in others. Um, so this was definitely the case in Iceland. So the cultural focus was on law, which became the catalyst in the organization of extrafamilial life and served as an element of continuity throughout Iceland's medieval history. Now, it's very interesting, even when it came to things like Christianity, when they made a conversion over to Christianity, they did so peacefully. Um, initially, it's thought that the first chieftains were probably people that were engaging in like the pagan rituals and maybe like a priesty type function, but then they kind of merged into chieftains. And then again, it became more formalized over time and evolved into a legal system. But when it came time to make the decision if they wanted to embrace Christianity or not, they settled it like everything else, they took it to court. And so you have this. Um, process whereby they sat down and said, okay, we're going to put on this, we're going to go ahead and go with Christianity. I um, still had some people doing their other rituals for a while, but they didn't really take action against that. It was a very peaceful process when they were making this conversion. Um, other few interesting things in terms of their cultural focus, they would try ghost. So if you thought that your house was haunted, then they would take the ghost to court and have this <laughs> Court. So you would have people come over, and you would select your judges, so you have your, your jury there, and then you would say, yes, ghost, I find you guilty. Um, I, I don't know how they got payment out of the ghost, but just an example of how far they took law. It really did uh, penetrate their society deeply. Ooh, they find the ghost not guilty? Mm -hmm. And like have the person owe a claim to the ghost? <laughs> I, I'm not exactly sure how they handled it. They, they talked about the process, but in terms of um, individual cases of precedent. It's neat too when you're looking through rocks, which is not the most exciting read, but aspects of it are exciting. So going through the laws is very intricate. So they would have different punishment, say you were to get in an altercation with somebody and, and knock their hat off. If their hat fell off in one direction, it would be a lesser penalty than if it fell off in another direction, one showing more aggression on your part. So they got down into some details on this. Uh, in one place it did say that whatever rules were longest were those that got written down, so it might be that you just put a lot of words in there and uh, you're coming up with these laws and writing for August. But it was very interesting, very detailed. Questions? Uh, you stated that an outlaw? That's what you call them, right? The outlaw? Yeah. Yes. Um, they would have to kill three other outlaws in order to remain there. So I, I would assume that they don't have much time, right? Because after they're deemed an outlaw, they have to get out of there. So the guy would have to go like on a shooting spree or something, right? Well, it's... Um, I'm not sure how many people did that. But yeah, it was one way that you could be accepted back in if you were claimed to be an outlaw. So if you were, if you found yourself in the position of being an outlaw, I would say that you probably would want to leave quickly, knowing that uh, other outlaws. That's a good idea. How would an outlaw who claimed to have killed three outlaws uh, demonstrate proof? Anytime there was murder, you had to announce it. Okay. And so they had a process whereby you would have to go to the closest neighbor, and they have all these rules about it, and you have to announce. I need witnesses to name that they witnessed that I blah, blah, blah. You go through and would disclose that you would murder this person. Um, so if you'd be taking the body somewhere or be bringing people to the body, but you would have to then have witnesses involved that would then attest to your having killed this individual. Um, I'm interested in how embedded was religion in the actually within medieval Iceland because it doesn't seem like religion was really a primary focus and it's interesting because if you, you know, look at other um, areas of the world where religion is you know, in, the, in the forefront, it's completely chaotic, which is why, yeah, it's really interesting.
I'd say initially it wasn't as important. Um, there are different theories as to what happened to medieval Iceland and led to its downfall in 1262 to uh, 64. So some people say some of the chieftains became very powerful and as they became more powerful, you had more conflicts between some of these individuals that held these chieftaincies, and then ultimately they went to Norway and said, hey, will you step in here? So we're having more conflicts. Um, there's one interesting theory that says it was actually religion that then started to interfere with the institutions that they had, uh, which is another question I'd like to investigate more. So specifically, you had the introduction of the tithe, um, and some changes were made in terms of if you had a church on your property, then you were able to collect some taxes from that. And this new system started to undermine some of the institutions that they already had in place and enabled then some of these chieftains to become more powerful and you started seeing these conflicts emerge. So initially I would say it wasn't important, but at the end it could have led to their demise once you had religion playing a larger role. So yeah, in the paper you mentioned that that was one of the explanations that that might have given some institutions power over others. How though, considering the decentralized structure and the almost absence of government coercion, how could they begin to impose a 10% or a tithing, uh, a Christian tithe on the people or on landowners or something of that sort? Um, in terms of just the individuals, you mean? Yeah, I mean, it was because like uh, if people were forced to tithe, right, and basically they're forced to pay a tax, so they introduced the tax uh, that you couldn't avoid, that you couldn't change chieftains or anything. I mean, like, how, or how, how, I mean, how did that get imposed? Like, how did the uh... um, the tax? It wasn't saying that you couldn't change chieftains. So that wasn't part of it. No, no, but I mean, like, you would have to pay it no matter which one you were in, right? Or that was the prepper. Okay. You had a prepper where you had to contribute in order for it, so that insurance organization. I was saying towards the end of the free state, you had some different uh, taxes that people could collect if they had churches on their property, and so this religion started to play a larger role. Some of those taxes kind of changed the structure that they had in place. But they were two separate things. Um, so I'm not sure which you are. And so the prepper is interesting. I've had that like, question asked a lot, like who enforced it? Yeah. And I mean, was it? My question is, was it a voluntary thing that people decide to start paying the tithing, or was it something that was imposed on them? The rapper was something that emerged there. We say it's voluntary, yeah. and then when it came to the church, I think that was coming from the outside. We started having bishops coming over to Iceland and trying to have the church take a more prominent place in their society. So okay. that started. That came later. So it wasn't something that they kind of uh, were coming up with themselves. Is this only of antiquarian interest, or what lessons do we get from the Icelandic uh, situation? How does it apply to nowadays? The things can work without a coercive centralized state, cooperate and have exchange um, without government. That's why I would say it's relevant. I find fascinating. Uh, the things worked very well for a long time. So you have the sagas that paint this picture of violence, but actually their dispute resolution process was quite peaceful. That was the last resort. When you think of the sagas that give that narrative, it's kind of like books today where you want to get readers, right? So they try and make those few battles that happen look very bloody to have people read them. Um, but it was generally peaceful. Women had enjoyed strong women's rights more so than some other places at the time. Uh, violence was relatively low compared to other countries at the time, so it was a peaceful place and was all able to happen without the centralized state. So I think that's why it's relevant, because you were able to have that. There's even an expression of that, if it bleeds, it leads <laughs> from the newspapers, so right. that might be the bias toward the violence. Right. Uh, the Icelandic case sounds very similar to like Benson's work on the Anglo-Saxon Bergeld system, mm -hmm. or uh, Alex Fink's work on um, the Hanseatic League, uh, or even Ed Stringham on the stock market in Amsterdam. The thing I like especially about Ed's work in the Hanseatic League is there's almost a, a tipping point when you have the functionality of the outlaw system that you can't get uh, representation in the courts unless uh, you have sort of a clear record of like, like your own rights are not protected 
Um, the Hanseatic League, that's, the timing was so important. It sounds very similar to, to in Iceland that but the reason why they have like a clearinghouse of all the court cases get heard on this, get heard on this day is because if you have any outstanding cases, you don't get to press charges against anyone else. You're, you're a de facto outlaw. Um, what tends to then happen in, in, in these other cases is you build commercial reputations on your stable court uh, history, right? If, if you have outstanding cases in the, in the criminal courts, more or less, you, you can't even gain access into the stock market, you can't buy or sell goods and services, you have no formal lease on property titles, etc. So not only, um, I mean, it seems like there's a reinforcing process between the networks that you're talking about, the sort of culture feedback uh, that might promote like economic development in, in, in some significant way. Um, and I wonder if uh, you, you have any comments about the, the role of civil society uh, in, in the wake of this functional system? Uh, like once it declines, how is it that people resolve problems? What what forms of trust do they use to to harness trade if they don't have this system? It's very similar to some of those other works that you mentioned. Um, so reciprocity was a big deal. Uh, culture played a very important role um, in their legal system. One thing too that was important to them was reputational effects. So they would rely on ostracism. So if you weren't making your payments and um, you know you were known to trespass against others, you'd be shunned from society. So they did have ostracism working. Also, they had a strong respect for honor. So they had a term for honor. It was hoff. So if you were a man of hoff, then you were an honorable individual. There were certain things that you didn't do, even when it came to. Um, this legal process or if somebody had trespassed against you, there were certain ways that you handled these situations and if you deviated from that, then you would be seen as being dishonorable and you were AHOF and that was a big deal. So they cared very much about how they were perceived in terms of honor. So there were a lot of these um, cultural ties that was making the whole thing function well. So you had not only the legal system, but it was their beliefs within it. Did Iceland face any invasion during this time? Okay. Um, what they were considering doing is a paper talking about why it was efficient. So Pete Leeson has his paper, Efficient Anarchy, where he goes through like the five important aspects of you know what can make something efficient, where can it work well. Um, so this would be one of those cases. One of the things they didn't face, invasion from outsiders. So it was unique in that they were coming from similar backgrounds, right? So they were able to have these institutions emerge that reflected their values, and they were able to do so in an environment in which you weren't fighting off invaders. They didn't have that additional component. Um, so it's, again, you also have people of similar backgrounds. Um, you didn't have a lot of variety in terms of their economy. Um, and it was a pretty homogenous population. So all of those things also factored into the emergence of their institutions. Um, in the case of medieval Iceland, do I guess historians or people that look back on it, do they consider it like actual anarchy or is it just like quasi anarchy or how would they actually classify their system in Iceland? Um, in the, the Free State, I would say more anarchy. So David Freeman had one of the first papers to talk about from an economic perspective, uh, but even some of the other pieces that I've read, they mentioned in there without a centralized state. Uh, the only when you talk about the preppers work, it's a little bit different. What type, how would you classify that? I mean, that you had these mandatory payments and you had to belong to it. So it's a little thorn in my side when I discuss the prepper and how to classify it. But you didn't have some uh, institution that would be uh, enforcing judgments, police system, or, or anything of that nature. Uh, considering that you had the joint chiefs in, I mean, it seems like it's great that you have that competition to leave whenever you want, but you can't decide, I'm not going to be a part of any chiefdom. Uh, I mean, does that show it more as to be kind of like a, I mean, it's not a centralized government, but it's still some form of uh, quasi-representative government or, or something of that sort, almost like city-states were in terms of like you could easily move to another city-state, but... I guess in that case you don't have one uh, individual group of individuals as a monopoly on them. Force. Mm -hmm. 
idea what time it is and how long it's worth. <laughs> to the uh, literature that Dan mentioned. I was going to mention David Friedman on um, Iceland and also Joe Peeman on Ireland. Uh, how does your work differ or is it overlap with um, David Friedman on Iceland and Joe Peeman on Ireland? Well, Friedman's paper is what I say is the seminal article on economics of it, so it's what piqued our interest initially. When uh, Dr. Williamson and I read it, it's like, this is neat. And we just started reading more on it. So I'd say it's from there that our work stemmed. And then it was just wanting to get more into the heart of the matter, how it emerged. So this paper was intended to kind of talk about it through a kayaking discovery process. And we'd like to do other papers that are more focused on how it worked. So he discusses the benefits of it, but doesn't go into great detail with some of the, uh, in terms of how it actually functioned, specific rules. So I think it would just try to get a, deeper look into how it actually works. Um, this cultural focus on love that they have, do you think that's more the cause of or the result of this work in free society? It's a good one. Uh, <coughs> work in free society. Is it the cause or the result of the, the efficiency of this free society? Uh, I think it was just that the they're going hand in hand, but by having these institutions, again, kind of helping set the rules of the game, it's then enabling more, more trade and cooperation among individuals. But you've also had that freedom first for these things to emerge, so kind of happening simultaneously. How influential and distinctive do you find the legacy of this period in modern Icelandic countries? I have not studied the modern Iceland institutions to be able to give you a good concrete answer on that one, I would say. I think that your past is going to matter, and those past institutions um, be influencing your current ones. Uh, I guess I'd be more interested to see how when these institutions were interfered with than what that did. Right? When you had this outside force that undermined the institutions that they had, and it changes the game, what the effect of that then is on, on future growth. Can you do a good answer? Um, so it was also interesting what you said earlier about how a lot of the um, people who migrated to Iceland came from very similar historical sort of backgrounds. So you have sort of this homogenous um, population of similar beliefs, similar values, um, and so maybe that added to the cohesiveness, I think. Right, which is one of the uh, variables that Lisa considers in this paper efficient energy, which is something that you saw present there. And also, some of the ones that were coming from Norway were escaping uh, King Harold Fine here, who had been encroaching on individuals' property rights. So they had a very real concern about wanting those rights to be protected. So they were leaving something <coughs> purposefully and, and, and had that in mind also. These institutions I found all this question very interesting. I don't know much about modern Iceland, I don't. <laughs> Asia, yeah. but I can extrapolate from other countries. For example, uh, we can compare England based on Adam Smith, namely, we could ask Shaw's question not about Iceland, but about England, namely, how much of an effect did Adam Smith have on modern England or Bastiat on modern France? And I guess, you know, with Hollande now in, in France and with the Labour Party or even the Conservative Party, which is a very free market, uh, you'd have to say not too much, because modern England has deviated a lot from Adam Smith and modern France has deviated a lot from Bastiat. So if we can extrapolate, we'd say that modern Iceland, I mean, the only thing I know about modern Iceland is Bobby Fischer played um, Spassky in Reykjavik. <laughs> um, but if I can extrapolate, I would say not too much, but probably France is better off, a little bit better off, from having Bastiat. 
And England is a little bit better off than having the Adam Smith because if we make a contrary to fact conditional that they never had Adam Smith with Austria, maybe even worse. I don't know, but it's all speculative. Seems like a kind of unusual among some of the other like if you look at countries that have the economic system they have, they're a lot more functional than some of the other ones. Well, maybe Various there were some of them. I, I would extrapolate that they're probably a little bit better off at least. Whereas other countries like, I don't know, Soviet Union or Russia never had an Adam Smith or a Bostriot. So maybe they're worse off. Well, Spain had the school of Salamanca, but they're still not very free enterprise. But maybe a, a marginal improvement. But in this context, too, you're talking about actual institutions. Where that's more talking about like individual people who are observing institutions in the countries. Like here, we have a period of 400 years of institutions that seem to be developed based on past cultural norms as well. Yeah, and that were agreed upon across widely, right? Yeah. Widely shared. So I, I would think that would have a larger effect than just one individual. But when I think of modern Iceland, I just think of like financial meltdown. <laughs> I mean, if you have to extrapolate, you, you're desperate, you take anything you can get. Uh, Adam Smith has to stand in for this whole culture of Bastion. Uh, you know, these contrary to fact conditions are very hard to do. So what is the ultimate explanation for its demise and the eventual you have the two, two theories. The main, I would say, the most accepted theory is that towards the end, you were had some chieftaincies that were able to get more and more followers. So it's almost like you had a couple families that were able to scoop up a lot of the chieftaincies. So they had the resources and reputation, and they were able to kind of buy those. And then at the end, you had these two uh, larger families kind of disputing with one another. So when they started to dispute, that introduced much more violence than what you had seen previously. So a lot of the violence um, shows up in the sagas a later period, right? When you were already having uh, this happen between these, these families themselves. Um, again, once it got to a certain point, I so said they just pretty much conceded to, to Norway and said, can you just step in here? We can't resolve our conflicts. So pretty much had them then take over. I think that's just easily accepted because, of course, you want to say, oh, the big bad families come and scoop up these commodities. And that's what happens. But uh, it's not talked about nearly as much the idea that you had religion playing a role. And I think that's the more interesting story. Is how exactly did that change their institutions? When you had the introduction of this tax, <coughs> and how much did it undermine what they already had in place? that then enable these families to amass such large sums of wealth. Um, so like I said, it functioned very well. It wasn't until the last um, oh, 40, 60 years or so that you started seeing this effect of these families gaining power. So it functioned very well for a long time. So it was about the same time that you had the introduction of this tax, tax that you saw that start to happen. Um, so I think that's the research question you delve into further. Start looking at that for timing. And did it play a role? I guess, of course, I wanted to because I like that explanation better, but I have to actually say it through. <laughs> another, while we're adding to the literature that Dan started, another entry would be Ben Powell's analysis of Somalia, which is also anarchistic ish. Um, my thought is that in 400 years, there's going to be some young professor who's going to talk about the present day, whereas right now we have 260 different countries and no world government, although it's sort of, um, the U.S. is trying to become the world government, and then there's the, always the U.N., but right now like there's a state of anarchy between, I don't know, Canada and Brazil or you know, Portugal and Australia, so there are forces for decentralization, and yet there are also forces for the U.N., and the U.S. is the world power, which would be forces for centralization. So it would be interesting if we were around here in 400 years, what they'll say about this period, which would be the equivalent of, what is it, 1262 or something? 1062. 1262. Uh, so that you have an analogy between what happened in Iceland and what's happening right now in that regard of, you know, should we get a world government or shouldn't we? 
I think actually what is cool about the whole story about Einstein is that actually it cuts against the literature of gap dependence. Because usually it comes like Einstein, once again, maybe I like water. Just like I'm thinking it's cold, so probably it's not so great to grow crops there. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know what's the climate conditions. And what's the in general what's this, uh, economic situation in back in those time days. You said they mainly engaged in uh, livestock, right? Production. Livestock and hunter-gathering, so things uh, No fishing. fishing. They had fishing for a while. What happened is that you didn't have a lot of trees there. They quickly exhausted a lot of the natural resources in terms of trees. So they literally didn't have a lot of wood after a time period. So their boats started to deteriorate, and then they weren't able to make new boats. So they were able to fish initially, and then after a time period, they relied more on whales beaching themselves on shore. And then they would have different rules about if you found it was yours or if you, you know, what were the property rights to the whales and things like that would happen. So you had that and then that was good crazy land grants. So, so some, agri some agriculture. Some agriculture, agriculture, yeah. Right? But, but limited. So in general you can say that iPhone really has unfavorable climate conditions for agriculture, right? In general. Yeah, not well, the best. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the point that I'm making because that's something interesting with the whole story is that uh, to explain how what happened there uh, was able to overcome the family dependence of countries like Iceland, because usually what do you have like countries like Iceland or Russia, you have communal societies. Mm -hmm. So you have societies that actually uh, tend to live in the urbanized areas, the rural areas. They tend to be more communal than less individualistic, which means they tend to have centralized state instead of actually decentralized system. So that's what the school of modern story. So, so, yeah. So something there cool yeah. happened. Yeah. Is it also one factor against them being more urbanized too? Since so much of it rested on that animal husbandry, you needed large tracts of land. So to be successful, people all had. Like I said, the first people that went there, they had enormous pieces of land, and then eventually it got broken up. But you couldn't break it down too far. Well, you want to be able to have your cattle and whatnot. So it didn't have a lot of centralization in that sense. So you have these large households. I mean, the households have important too, since they were more uh, individualized and these household units. So that's kind of the first. Very interesting. So uh, this point video brings up is really interesting because it, it parallels like a lot of like Rancher Olson's comments mm -hmm. about like stationary versus really banditry that. Uh, the, the original states were, or, or the original roaming bandits that made the, the sort of incentive to live in communal society, they were more uh, herdsmen. Um, you were nomadic, you didn't necessarily plant crops and, and stay in the same place, but you had a comparative advantage of raping, pillaging, and plundering if you herded goats or something, because as you moved from town to town to town, you could sort of steal from the the agricultural societies on the market. So I wonder how you could do a comparative investigation about the types of conflict resolution norms and legal processes that come about in a uh, uh, animal husbandry context where, where you have to overcome uh, contract enforcement for, for accidental livestock. I mean, similar to like Ellickson type stuff mm -hmm. in the frontier. Actually, yeah. I was going to tell you that in terms of people should definitely yeah, something looks like something's been like eggs and stuff. It's like how how you take care of whose whose goat is whose and yeah. who's just grazing off of whose land, as opposed to uh, who like land ownership and 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 like violent conflict or um, or theft of of, of uh, crop. Um, the, the concept of animal husbandry and, and, and herding property and stuff is, is probably a different path dependency and sort of cultural influence on the legal system. And it's interesting in reading uh, the sagas or excerpts of the sagas because so much of the disputes did come from those types of trespass and if you had cattle on other lands and how you, you handled that. Benson and again, also. there were different uh, honorable ways to handle that and right. people infringed on it and that's usually when things escalated to another level. The rule of the hundred in Benson's work is all based on horse ownership. Like, foundation of like all contemporary legal systems like who owns what horse. Like gotta gotta see a man about horses <clears throat> the ultimate source of civilization. Did they brand the animals? 
Given the competitive nature of the Chiefsons, uh, it seems that like over time it seems difficult to try to prevent uh, like a few certain Chieftains from becoming comparatively better than everyone else and everyone wanting to go into those Chieftains. Uh, I mean like when you have a, an effective Chieftain or something, like what's the economy of scale there, I guess, for like chieftain, chieftainship? I mean, and how that, I mean, do you think that's one of the reasons why like the inability to keep a check on that power uh, kind of led to the intervention of Norway. I mean, I guess that's the kind of narrative that's given, but I mean, as chieftains got better, people flooded more into them. Was there any checks on that power in that essence, or was that just kind of like a long-term thing that was going to happen? To add with everything else, it would just be a competition itself. So people did have an incentive to want to be chieftain, some liked it for the respect aspect um, of having that title. There would be things that would come along with it. Like I said, there's this uh, culture of reciprocity if you're trying to build these different relationships and you would be exchanging gifts with your chieftains in terms of getting their support for um, it became legal system or uh, law season and stuff like that. So you did have an incentive to want to be a chieftain. So I'd say there's still just competition as people are trying to offer the best product, be the most knowledgeable, that it wouldn't just evolve into one chieftain getting all the power because others would have a strong incentive to also be able to. Could to chieftains their own form power. like joint company or like joint chieftainships basically or like merge? They were all individual. So I said the, when yeah. at the end when you had the 48 chieftaincies. Uh, you didn't merge any of those and have some super chieftaincy or something like that. So you had these distinct chieftaincies, but it was towards the latter period that you did have a couple families that were able to buy up several of those chieftaincies. So the thought being that you did have some of that happening. I wanted to mention a possible objection to your talk today and a defense. Okay. The, the objection would be like if somebody just listened to this superficial day and say, this is an economics club. What you're talking about is law. There's hardly much economics, there's a lot of law out of the law work. That would be the objection. The defense, and maybe you can add to the defense, is there is, you know, there are many different areas of economics. There's micro, macro, uh, labor, uh, international trade. One of them is law and economics. And sort of the overlap between law and economics. And this is uh, right in the middle of that a subdiscipline of economics where you try to explain why the law is and you base it on economics, property rights and markets and things like that. So that would be the defense. So not that you need a defense, but I thought that you might add on uh, your comments on the possible defense against this objection. See, I got interested in this subject because I'm more of a development economist, so international economic development, and what I look at most is just institutions, and primarily it was private property rights, and then started you know, reading David Freeman's article and reading about ICE and thought, well, that's really neat. Um, so those institutions are going to be important for economic growth, right? Your institutions matter. It's life or death. You have good ones in place. You have economic growth. People live. You have bad ones in place. And people die. Um, so that's where I find it fascinating. It's just how your institutions merge, how they are able to encourage or discourage exchange and relationships between